Well, this morning we have the privilege of looking at the book of Exodus, a very wow. important and exciting book. It's, uh, it's the book about the birth of Israel as a nation. I mentioned that at the end of Genesis, uh, Jacob and his family, because of a famine, moved to Egypt where Joseph had become a ruler and where there was uh, plenty of food. The Pharaoh gave Jacob's family permission to stay in the land of Goshen, which was uh, one of the most uh, productive places of grass to feed sheep. They were shepherds. And so they settled in, and they were pretty comfortable in, in spite of the famine. They had plenty, and they were part of the royal family. I mean, in a sense, Joseph was uh, you know, a very powerful official, so his family would have had privileges. We don't read much about these privileges, but we do read in Exodus that some generations now have passed. Joseph died at the end of Genesis chapter 50, and now some time has passed. How much time? We're not told in the narrative. But another Pharaoh comes along who, it says, did not know Joseph. And uh, I don't know if that means he didn't know about Joseph, or he, he was just came along later on, he didn't acknowledge Joseph. There's some question as to which Pharaohs that are known from history are the pharaohs in this story. And we'll talk a little bit about that, although we may not be able to settle with certainty which pharaohs we're talking about. But there did rise at some point a pharaoh who did not recognize Joseph, and he realized that the Hebrew people who were in the land of Egypt were multiplying very quickly, and he was afraid that if their multiplication were to continue uh, without any controls, that they might become so numerous as to be a threat to Egypt's security, if they would wish to join Egypt's enemies in a battle or whatever, then uh, Egypt would be uh, at a disadvantage with so many Hebrew people in their borders. So this particular pharaoh decided to thin the population, <clears throat> and he decided to uh, begin to kill off Hebrew baby boys, and that was the beginning of what happens in the first chapter of Exodus. So we now have the Israelites in a very different situation than they were in at the end of Genesis. They're in the same place, Egypt, but conditions have changed. At the end of Genesis, they are a favored people, the relatives of the most powerful man under Pharaoh himself. Uh, but now they are uh, persecuted in the same land. This persecution continued for some hundreds of years, apparently. And... Um, Eventually, Moses rises up early in the story, and he becomes the one that God uses to deliver them. And Moses, who arises early in Exodus, also is the dominant character in the rest of the book, and as well as in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then he is, his death is recorded at the end of Deuteronomy. So we're now in this section of the Pentateuch that concerns itself with the lifetime of Moses. Now, that means that the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy are one fairly continuous narrative. There's no, no excellent reason to doubt that Moses was the author of these books since he was there when these stories were happening and, he's, and he was literate and he could write them. Um, some have wondered whether we need to see Genesis as part of the same collection. The Bible nowhere says that Moses wrote Genesis. The Bible does say, at least Jesus and the apostles spoke of uh, Moses as the one who gave them the law. Now, the law could mean the Ten Commandments and all of that, but it could also mean the Torah, the whole five books of Moses, which would include Genesis. It's a matter of interpretation. We do have in the New Testament quotations from Exodus and from Leviticus and from Deuteronomy that are all attributed to Moses. So even the New Testament names some of these books, but not Genesis. They don't, though Genesis is quoted about 60 times in the New Testament, it, is, it doesn't mention Moses as the author. It doesn't deny that Moses is the author either, and the Jews all believe that Moses wrote the entire Torah, which includes Genesis. And there's good reason to believe that. I think, I, I mean, there's, we should believe that too. Uh, the book of Exodus in the Hebrew begins with the word and. Now, in the, in the New Living Translation, it leaves out the word and, but, and the opening verse of Exodus in the New Living Translation is, these are the sons of Jacob. But, in the Hebrew, it reads, these are the names, or it says, and these are the names. So, when you start a book with the word and, 
it presupposes something else you know, was, you know, already known to the same readers. And what's most natural to be what was known was what we just read in Genesis, because we read about these very people going into Egypt. This gives the names of them who went in. And also, the book of Exodus, as you read through it, it presupposes that the readers know who Abraham is, and who Isaac and Jacob are, and who Joseph is. Um, and, and that they know about the story of the six-day creation, which is, of course, from Genesis. Because on the Mount Sinai, when God gives the law, and he gives the Sabbath commandment, in Exodus 20, he says, because in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Obviously, referring back to the opening chapters of Genesis. So, the readers of Exodus are assumed to, to have some background knowledge of the things that are actually in Genesis. And that, again, gives the impression that the same author probably has written all five of the books. And that's, that's the traditional view of the Jews. That's the traditional view of the church. And that's, to my mind, the view that the evidence would support as well. Now, Moses, of course, I've said was qualified to write this. So not everybody was literate, certainly not all the Hebrews, since eventually they became slaves and remained slaves for several generations. And as slaves, they would not be educated and literate. But Moses was rescued as a baby and adopted into the household of Pharaoh, where he was given a good education. Therefore, of the Hebrews of that generation, he may have been the only one, or at least one of very few, who was capable of writing and therefore would be the most likely author of these books, even if we weren't told otherwise, we could have maybe deduced it. Uh, he was also familiar with both Egyptian and Midianite uh, geography, which are mentioned in these books, because he was raised in Egypt and he also spent 40 years uh, tending sheep out in Midian. And so we read about geographical things there that he would be familiar with. Um, and then there's three places in the book of Exodus that specifically refer to Moses' writing. So the book itself, we could say, claims that Moses is the author. Now those places, if you'd like to see them, are in Exodus chapter uh, 17, 14, where it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for memorial in the book of the, and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, etc. Now, God told Moses to write something down. Obviously, Moses was literate. Moses had writing materials, and God told him to write at least these things down. That doesn't mean he wrote the whole book, but if he wrote that part of the book, what would prevent us thinking he wrote the rest as well? Also, in chapter 24, and verse 4, it says, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. This is actually referring to the laws that were given in chapters 21 through 23. It's a block of laws that God gave, and, it, and that's what it says he's writing down. These, all these words of the Lord, Moses wrote down. But again, if he wrote down those chapters of Exodus, there's no evidence that anyone else wrote the other chapters of Exodus, probably it supports the general theory that he wrote the whole book. Also in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, <clears throat> Exodus 34, in verse 28 it says, So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> now, by the way, this probably means God wrote, but there are some who believe this means that, that Moses wrote. <coughs> the Ten Commandments. <coughs> so, that probably is not a good reference to Moses being the author, because it, although it's ambiguous who wrote, whether it's Moses or the Lord, I think we have evidence from other parts that it was the Lord who wrote on the tablets of stone. So, we have at least two places in Exodus that clearly speak of Moses' writing, and of course we have the long-standing traditions of the Jews and Christian church that he's the author. Now, the New Testament refers to Moses as the author of the Exodus in a number of places. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 10, Jesus said that Moses commanded, uh, or Moses gave you these commandments, which Jesus actually referred to as the, as the word of God, but he says Moses wrote, uh, you shall honor your father and your mother, and whoever... Uh, curses father and mother, let him be put to death. 
Now, those are two different laws, both found in Exodus. And Jesus said Moses wrote that. So, if he wrote that, he probably wrote the rest too. <coughs> in chapter 12 of Mark, in verse 26, Jesus said that uh, Moses, or the book of Moses, that Moses wrote, uh, God says to Moses at the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's in Mark chapter 12 and verse 26. Jesus said that Moses wrote that too, which is again in Exodus. Uh, in Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, Thus it, was, it had to be fulfilled all that was written to me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So he just mentions Moses as the author of the whole law, and certainly Exodus is where we find the law written. Jesus also said in John 7, 19, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? It's John 7, 19. Did not Moses give you the law? So Jesus confirms the Jewish tradition. Hebrews chapter 19, I'm excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19, there are not 19 chapters in Hebrews, but <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 19, uh, we read, <clears throat> When Moses had spoken every precept of all that the Lord had uh, spoken, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats and did such and such. Now it says that Moses spoke these precepts. So we have the book of Exodus and the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles, testifying that Moses wrote it. Now you might say, well, that's kind of laboring a point we never really seriously doubt it, isn't it? You know, why do you have to prove that? The reason is because there's a very long-standing, uh, over, over a century long, um, liberal tradition that Moses didn't write any of this, and that it was the result of four traditions. I was telling you earlier about the documentary hypothesis, which suggests that the whole Pentateuch was the product of four traditions that were orally transmitted after the time of Moses, never written down until about a thousand years after Moses' time, if he even existed, because liberals don't necessarily stand by the historical accuracy of the books either. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So we come to the book of Exodus as a continuation of, uh, of Genesis. And let me tell you um, a few things about the book before we get into the contents of the book. Okay. Uh, there is some controversy over whether the Exodus really happened. And this is based on questions of why don't we have external proof of it? Well, what kind of external proof would you want? Well, perhaps Egyptian historical records? It would be a very significant event in the history of Egypt if the whole Pharaoh's army was drowned in the Red Sea and, and those 10 plagues totally wasted Egypt's economy and they lost three million slaves who escaped. Some people think, well, that would certainly be something the Egyptians would write about. And we do have Egyptian history from that period uh, that has been discovered. Obviously, it's not comprehensive, but it's not as if it's nothing. And we don't have any real clear confirmation that the Exodus occurred in Egyptian records. More than that, <clears throat> they say archaeology um, does not necessarily prove or support the idea of the Exodus. The idea that three million Jews lived in the land of Goshen, in the Nile Delta, uh, they, don't, they don't find proof of all those people living there. And archaeologists haven't discovered the evidence of it, they say. Also, in the Sinai Peninsula, where it is presumed that Israel spent 40 years wandering, you'd expect to find some artifacts there. And archaeologists have not found evidence in the Sinai Peninsula that there were th three million people wandering around living there for 40 years, living and dying, leaving their bones behind, and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, because of this, because of the lack of external confirmation, many have said, well, the Exodus is just a fiction. Even modern Jews sometimes don't believe in the Exodus. Now, realize, the Exodus is the founding of the nation of Israel. It's like any nation's story of how they were founded, the book of Exodus is how the Israelite nation was founded. And even Jews today, many of them, liberals, do not believe the Exodus occurred. However, conservative Jews and conservative Christians, of course, do. I do. And these objections are not impossible to answer. For one thing, we know that historians 
usually recorded the history of their nation that was flattering to their kings. Kings didn't like historians to record things that were an embarrassment to them. And certainly the Exodus would have been a huge embarrassment to Pharaoh. Pharaoh came out looking like a, you know, a total weakling and a fool. And, <clears throat> and to kind of leave that out of the historical records would be perhaps something that a wise historian would make a choice to do just to keep himself on good terms with the pharaohs. And often the histories are always selective. And very typically, the histories of nations are those records of things that were flattering to the nation. That are, they show their nation to be glorious and their kings to be powerful and wonderful. <coughs> Israel's history, by the way, is one exception. Because in the Old Testament, we find how sinful and how evil many of the kings of Israel were. But that's because we're reading the word of God. We're reading truth about Israel, and they actually are more honest than many nation, national records would be. Yes, Rose? So do you think that's why, instead of like saying Pharaoh's name, they just refer to him as Pharaoh? Because it's like very... I'm not sure if that's the reason. I'm going to address that point. Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that would be the reason for it. Okay. It, it, <clears throat> it might be. It's, pardon my coughing. I've got some congestion or something in there. It's not bothering me, but I'm sure it'll bother you when I cough. Um, <laughs> as, far as, as far as there being no uh, archaeological records in Goshen, in, in the Nile Delta, of these people living there, I'm not sure that we could expect too much. They lived in mud houses, and in the subsequent flooding through the last 3,500 years, those would have often probably entirely washed away. There might be some remains. Now, by the way, if you go online on YouTube, you will find there are some documentaries put out by Christians about the Exodus. One of them that you may want to watch is called Patterns of Evidence. I'm not going to go into that evidence right now. It's, com it's comprehensive. Uh, there's a lot of interesting evidence in support of the Jews having been in Goshen. Uh, but the question is whether skeptics want to interpret the evidence that way or not. Many skeptics say we don't have evidence of it. Others say that we actually do. There are some findings in that region that are very interesting, which I just commend to you the video, Patterns of Evidence. Uh, if you look that up on YouTube or, or on maybe Netflix, mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> I think you'll find it there. Mm -hmm. And there are some other, other good uh, Exodus uh, videos too out there. There's, there's actually quite a few alternative uh, researchers who have found things that are very encouraging to believe in the Exodus happened. Um, we're just talking about secular evidence here now. We have the Bible, of course, and that's evidence enough for me. If we had no other evidence at all, I mean, we don't have a lot of evidence for the six-day creation either, but if the Bible said it, I, <clears throat> I don't need other historical records of it. Uh, <clears throat> also, the fact that they haven't really found the artifacts of the Jews living in uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, well, we have to remember they didn't settle there. They didn't live in buildings. Mm -hmm. They lived in tents, uh, you know, made of goat skin and things like that. Or, and they're not likely that for 3,500 years those things are going to survive the elements. And it's not like they were leaving, you know, plastic bags behind <laughs> in their, in their uh, you know, sites. Uh, you know, what they ate was biodegradable, what they wore was biodegradable, and uh, I guess the one thing we might expect to find are bones, and there were about three million people or so, <coughs> excuse me, probably more like about 1,200,000 people who died during that generation, but that's a big peninsula, and it's covered with sand, and you know, sand moves in, in sandstorms, things like that, I mean, the bones could easily be covered up and they wouldn't be all dying in one place. They'd be dying over a period of 40 years as they traveled around, so their bones would be here, there, and everywhere. I, and jackals would carry off bones, and uh, you know, there's, there's many reasons why you might not yet have found the bones of people who died there almost 4,000 years ago, if their bones are even still around. So I'm saying that those who have critically said, well, the Exodus doesn't, you know, we don't have any evidence that it happened, archaeology or historical records well even if that's true it's not necessarily that relevant because it's not damning to the 
to, to the thesis that the exodus really happened. Uh, furthermore, there are some evidences that have come up. And one of the most important things that people have noticed is that Exodus is the national history of the founding of Israel. If it was not historically true, who would make up such a story? Most nations have glorious records of their founding. Uh, I realize Australia is kind of a, a, an exception because, uh, because they were founded by as a colony of, of prisoners, but, but they had no option of hiding that. That happened in recent history enough that they couldn't make up some kind of other story and get away with it. But when Israel, let's say if this was written as some people say a thousand years after the founding of Israel, and they're making up a fictional story of how they start up, that they're all slaves, that they're all oppressed by a, a more powerful nation themselves, and they, they escaped and then they were rebellious to their leader Moses, and they were, you know, there, there's nothing very flattering to Israel in any of this history. Most people would not make up a fictional history of the founding of their nation that made them uh, uh, a nation of slaves who were, really had a hard time adjusting to being a free people and so forth under a, a great leader that they didn't accept very well and didn't, and didn't obey very well. It's just not a very flattering history. It's not the kind of history that nations write about themselves. Even when they're writing true history, they leave out embarrassing things. And if they're making it up out of whole cloth, they're, they're going to make it somewhat more flattering to their nation. So, I mean, it's hard to explain how this story could have come about if, it would, if, if the events didn't come about, why the record would suggest that this is how they came to be a nation. There is evidence in archaeology that many different foreigners from different lands were building bricks for the Egyptians during this period of time, and that many of the brick buildings um, were uh, you know, mud brick were made by foreign slaves. That's what the Hebrews would be in Egypt, foreign slaves, if the book of Exodus is true. One thing that's interesting is the city of Ramesses is one of the cities, in, in Exodus chapter 1, it talks about the treasure cities of Egypt that the Israelite slaves built. Ramesses is one of the ones mentioned. And that city has been excavated. And one thing that's really interesting about what they found was in the lower levels of bricks in the buildings, there was finely cut straw in the mud bricks, mm -hmm. which gives it adhesion. But as you move up the wall, <coughs> there isn't finely cut straw in the bricks. There's grass and stubble uh, pulled up by the roots and, and put in there. As you go higher in the wall, the bricks are all mud without any straw at all in them. Now, that's what archaeologists have found. What the Exodus says is that Israel was first provided with straw by the Egyptians to build the bricks. But when Moses challenged Pharaoh, we are told, uh, Pharaoh got angry and he stopped giving them straw, but he told them they still have to build as many bricks. And so they had to go out and grab grass and use it for straw. And no doubt they ran out of grass eventually and had to keep making bricks, so they started making bricks that didn't have straw in them. This is something that is actually testified to by archaeology in that particular city, which is named in Exodus as one of the ones they built. So, you know, there are, there are kind of incidental things in support. What was the name? Ramesses. Yeah, in what chapter? Uh, in chapter one. Uh, let me see here. Maybe it's in chapter 2. Um, I don't have it written down, so I'm just oh, saying. Okay. Let me see if it's in chapter 2. No, I think it's chapter 1. I'm, uh, I'll have to look for it here because I don't have it in my notes. Okay. And they, so, um, uh, chapter 1, verse um, 11. Verse 11, thank you. Therefore, they set taskmasters' burdens. They built Pharaoh's supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Actually, you know, the information I gave you was actually about Pithom. My mistake. I don't think it was Ramesses. I think it was, it was Pithom that they found the bricks uh, in the condition I just described. So I'm glad we looked that up because I forgot it was Pithom, not Ramesses. Um, also, there is uh, an Egyptian 
monument that has been found from Pharaoh Merepta, uh, Merepta excuse me, Merenta, it says a NPT altogether here, it's M E R E N P T A H. You can pronounce that at your, however you want to. Uh, <coughs> that's from the year 1209 BC which would have been during the period of the Judges, it would have been after the Exodus, but during the period of the Judges in the Bible. And this uh, Pharaoh mentions in, that he invaded Israel in the land of Canaan. And that would mean that Israel at that time was in Canaan, which is the general time that, as we say, the Bible would put them there after the Exodus. It doesn't prove the Exodus, but it's uh, just a, somewhat, a confirmation from Egyptian records that Israel at that time was in Canaan which is where the Bible would place them after the Exodus. Um, and there are evidences, at, 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 there, there, there's some question as to where Mount Sinai is. And there's a new theory about where Mount Sinai is that is very convincing, and there are evidences at that location, it's in Arabia, Saudi Arabia, uh, of, of Israelite camps. There's a number of uh, rocks and carvings and so forth that are of Israelite origin at the foot of this mountain that has all burnt on the top. And uh, there are many now who believe that that's Mount Sinai. And it would therefore confirm, if, if this is so, that Israel did exist at that time and did camp there and, and so forth. It does confirm some of the history of, of the book of Exodus. But there are many things in Exodus we will not be able to confirm, at least not immediately, and we don't need to. Because when the Bible says something is true, if it is the Word of God, it's the best testimony from history we, we have in need. There have been many times, by the way, in history that skeptics have said the Bible made a mistake about something. For example, the Hittites are a people that Abraham encountered in Canaan. He bought, uh, he bought uh, Machpelah, the cave for burial, from a Hittite. And the Hittites were one of the Canaanite tribes in uh, Canaan in the time of Abraham and later. The Hittites are also found later in Israel's history and even in David's history. Uh, Uriah, one of his mighty men, the, the first husband of Bathsheba, was a Hittite. Uh, but for a long time, skeptics in modern times said there never were any Hittites. That they were just a fictional people made up in a fictional story in the Bible. They're, they couldn't find any evidence for the existence of Hittites. So they just said the Bible's wrong, the Bible's making up stories, the Hittites never existed. But then, of course, as we might expect, they began to discover more things archaeologically. And now they've discovered a great deal about the Hittites. Mm -hmm. At this point, they are capable of documenting 1,500 years of Hittite history from archaeological finds. Mm -hmm. So the Bible was right all, the, all along when the skeptics were saying, oh, there's no evidence for this. But wait around, they'll find it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Daniel chapter 5, we we're told the last king in Babylon when it fell to the Persians was Belshazzar. You, that's the story about the writing on the wall in Daniel chapter 5. And Belshazzar was the king of Babylon and when it fell to the Persians, Medes and Persians. Until the 1800s, skeptics were saying that the Bible is wrong about that because we have other ancient historical records from Herodotus and Thucydides, about 400 years before Christ each, that said that the last king in Babylon was named Nabonidus. So a conflict. The secular historians not so far from the time period, said that the last king of Babylon was Nabonidus. The Bible said the last king was Belshazzar. So the claim was the Bible's mistaken. The book of Daniel's fiction, the writer of Daniel lived too late afterward and was guessing and didn't know who the real king of Babylon was, and so we can't trust the historicity of it. And they said that until about 1853, which is 165 years ago. And they unearthed in Ur of the Chaldees, in Babylon, uh, an old temple to a Babylonian god. And Nabonidus, the alleged last king of Babylon, had written an inscription on it. And he said to this god, may reverence for you always dwell in my firstborn favorite son, Belshazzar. Now, when they found this inscription about Nabonidus having a firstborn favorite son named Belshazzar, this was the first time anywhere in history outside of Daniel 5 that the name Belshazzar was known. That means after Belshazzar died, 
the memory of him is totally lost to history until the year 1853. Mm -hmm. He was lost to history for 2,500 years. And then they find an inscription where Nabonidus mentions him. Now, Daniel remembered him. Daniel mentioned him. Daniel was right. For 2,500 years, the other historians were wrong. <laughs> now, what we know now is interesting about uh, that because what is known from other inscriptions that have been found was that Nabonidus was, in fact, the king and the father of Belshazzar, but he was in semi-retirement. Actually, at the time Babylon fell, Nabonidus was in Arabia on other business. He had left the city of Babylon in, under the charge of his son, Belshazzar, who was also called king. And so there were two kings. The one that Daniel mentions is the one that was there in Babylon, Belshazzar. So we have a confirmation from history now that Daniel was right when all the skeptics thought he was wrong. And What's interesting there is you read Daniel 5, when, Nebuchadne uh, when Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall and it terrified him, he said, find somebody who can interpret this writing for me, I'll make him the third ruler in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. The Bible nowhere says why he would say third ruler. The Bible doesn't mention that he himself is only the second ruler, but we know that from archeology span now. Nabonidus was the first, Belshazzar the second, and he was offering position of third ruler to whoever could interpret the writing. So there's interesting ways in which archaeology eventually catches up with the Bible. <laughs> the Bible's way ahead, like uh, 2,500 years ahead of science on this or archaeological discovery. And that's true of many other things. Sargon II, the king of Assyria, is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. For centuries, scholars, there never was a Sargon II, and then they discovered his, his palace and, and, and his name and all that stuff. This kind of stuff happens a lot. That's been the trend in archaeology, actually. For, you know, whenever the archaeologists have not yet found anything that confirms a biblical story, they assume the Bible's wrong. But the trend has always been the other direction. As they find more, they were wrong, and the Bible was right. So if we say, well, we don't have much evidence for the Exodus that's very conclusive from archaeology, my counsel is wait around a while. We haven't discovered everything yet, but the tendency and the, ten, uh, the, the trend in discovery has been to confirm the Bible and not otherwise. So, is there external evidence of the Exodus? You might say yes. There are some things that can be interpreted that way, and some Christians uh, do. But even if the skeptics say, well, that's too ambiguous or that's not conclusive, that's not important. The Bible is correct. It's written by someone who was there. And uh, our modern scholars were not there. Now, I want to just say something about the length of the captivity, because in chapter 12, uh, in verse 40, it said the Israelites were captive in Egypt for 430 years. Now, when does that 430 years start? Does it start with the time that Joseph went into Egypt as a captive? Does it start from the time later when his father and brothers came there? They were not exactly captives, but they were now away from their homeland in a foreign land and eventually became slaves. But when does it begin? Does it begin with the Pharaoh who rose up who didn't know Pharaoh, uh, Joseph and put them under chains? Uh, is that when it begins? It's not entirely clear. Uh, there is one theory that the captivity in Egypt actually begins long earlier in the time of Abraham. Now, uh, we might just say... We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, uh, who lived in the Promised Land, were not captives in Egypt. But some would say that the first time Abram went down into Egypt in Genesis 12, and Sarah, who uh, was Abram's wife, was taken into the... I'm sorry, in chapter 20. I think. No, it was 12. Chapter 12 of Genesis. He, it, it, Abram did this twice. He went... Once he went to Egypt and once he went to Gerar, and both times he said that Sarah was his, uh, his sister, and she was taken into the harem of the king. Uh, I think it's in chapter 12 that in Egypt she was taken into Pharaoh's harem. And one could argue that was the beginning of Israel's captivity in Egypt, because she was at the mercy of the Pharaoh. Now, it was not a steady, unbroken period of captivity, but it was the first time. That, any, that Israel was in Egypt and at the mercy of the Pharaoh. 
they had times of, of course, liberty after that, but then they went into more of a constant uh, period of, of slavery. And some think that the 430 years really starts in Abraham's time, not Joseph's time, or after Joseph's time, but in Abraham's time it starts. And that would mean that uh, the first half of that period, 215 years, that's half of 430, was actually before the captivity proper began. That, that the 430 years mentioned in Exodus 1240 really includes much of the period of the time in Genesis. Uh, almost the whole period of Abraham's and Isaac and Jacob's lives were included in this. And that the period of actual bondage under a pharaoh after Joseph's time would be considerably shorter, uh, possibly only about 200 years. And the reason for that is you can calculate the ages of the men and so forth and realize that uh, when Jacob went into captivity, went into Egypt when, in Joseph's last time, it was 215 years after Abraham had gone into Egypt earlier. That's half of the 430 years. And so the actual captivity after Joseph's time might have only been a couple of centuries instead of 400. It depends on where you calculate the beginning of it. Um, we don't have to really sort that out unless we're people trying to figure out exact dates and times of the Exodus and so forth, as people do. Now, there's two basic theories about when the Exodus took place. One theory is it happened around 1270 B.C. And that's based on the assumption that one of the pharaohs in the book of Exodus was Ramesses II. Why would that be assumed to be so? Well, because the Israelites built the city of Ramesses, presumed to be named after Ramesses II, and therefore presumed to be, you know, commissioned by the uh, pharaoh Ramesses to build a city after his name. That's pretty much the main reason for putting the uh, Exodus in the time of Ramesses. And that'd be around 1270 BC. Later pharaoh couldn't have had them build a, a city and named it after an earlier pharaoh, Ramesses. We don't know which pharaoh actually commissioned it. It wasn't, didn't have to be Ramesses himself. After all, in the United States, our first president was named George Washington, and there's many cities, or there's a state called Washington, that was not founded by George Washington. Uh, he was long dead before the state of Washington was uh, incorporated. Uh, things are often named after former political figures. Uh, there's many cities named Lincoln, which were not founded by Abraham Lincoln in the United States. So, I mean, there could be a city named Ramesses that a later pharaoh had commissioned. So we don't have any certain reason to believe that the Israelites uh, escaped during the time of Ramesses necessarily. Um, the better date, in my opinion, is a couple centuries earlier. And that'd be around 1446 BC. This fits better in some respects, the, the facts of the Exodus, and it would suggest the shorter period of captivity. It, it would suggest a 200 year less captivity before the Exodus, so that would be one reason that we're considering it. Um, there, was a, there was a series of pharaohs called Hyksos, their ethnic designation, they're the Hyksos pharaohs, spelled H-Y-K-S-O-S. These pharaohs were not native Egyptians. They were invaders. They were of Semitic origin. Semitic would be not necessarily Jewish, but of the same general family line as the Jews. The Ju the Semitic means from Shem. Shemitic, that's where you get the word Semitic. Shem was one of the sons of Noah. Abraham came from Shem, so the Jews are Semitic people. But there are other Semitic, the Arabs are Semitic people too. Uh, when we talk about someone being anti-Semitic, we usually think of them being anti-Jewish. They might even be Arabs who are anti-Jewish, but Arabs are Semitic people too. Uh, in any case, the Hyksos were a Semitic race who had invaded and, and conquered Egypt, and, they, and the pharaohs of a certain period of time were the Hyksos pharaohs who were Semitic. But in 1446, the 16th dynasty of the pharaohs, um, the Hyksos had been run out. So there are no pharaohs that were now native Egyptians. Now, what would that mean? It might mean that the pharaoh who had shown such kindness to Joseph 
was a Semite, was a Hyksos pharaoh. And the pharaoh who rose up who didn't appreciate Joseph was an Egyptian pharaoh after the Hyksos had been driven out. The idea being that the somewhat ethnic affinity between Joseph as a Jew, as an Israelite, uh, and the pharaoh of his time, who remains unnamed in the Bible, uh, who elevated him, it may be that there's some favorable treatment there because there wasn't the ethnic difference that would have existed between an Israelite and ethnic Egyptians. But the later pharaoh that didn't like pharaoh Joseph and didn't care for the Israelites would be perhaps then not a Semite and a, a, a return to the Egyptians to power in their own country. This would be the scenario that many people think was true if the Exodus was as early as 1446, and it could well be. Uh, some of the reasons for saying so is that in 1 Kings 6.1, when Solomon dedicated the temple, it was much later than the Exodus, obviously, but it was the fourth year of Solomon's uh, reign, which is the year 966 BC. Now, this is going to be something important. I'm sorry that it's so complex. Did you say 1 Kings? In, this is in 1 Kings, yeah, 1 Kings 6 1. 1 Kings. Yeah, we say 1 Kings, 1 Kings is fine too. 1 Kings 6 1. Um, Solomon said that the Exodus had occurred 480 years earlier than his dedication of the temple. He actually mentions. Uh, when he dedicated the temple in the fourth year of his reign, he said the Exodus had occurred 480 years earlier. Now, he dedicated the temple in 966 B.C. 480 years earlier would be the year 1406. And therefore, it would place uh, you know, the Exodus in the very range we're talking about. Also, the judge named Jephthah, in the period of Judges, in uh, about 1100 BC, he said that Israel had inhabited the land for 300 years. It says that in Judges 1126. Judges 1126. Jephthah said that in his day, Israel had been in, in the land for 300 years. And that seems to be confirmed also by Paul in his sermon in Acts 13. 19 through 20. I'm sorry we're not taking the time to look these up. I'm just telling you their general contents for the sake of the information. So, in the time of Jephthah, during the Judges, Israel had been in the land for 300 years. And, and Jephthah made that comment around 1100 B.C. Later on, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he said the Exodus had been 480 years earlier. And that would place, both of those statements would agree in placing the Exodus in the 1400s BC, not the 1200 BCs, as some people think, not during the time of Remesis. Um, also, in the book of Ruth, at the end of Ruth, chapter 4, verses 21 through 22, it gives sort of a genealogy of David. And it places only five generations between the invasion of Canaan, that is the time of Rahab, who was an ancestor of David's, from, Rahab was spared when Joshua invaded Canaan. So from the invasion of Canaan in the time of Rahab to David is only five generations. Now the invasion of Canaan, uh, that would be followed by the period of the judges and then by the reign of Saul and then the time of David. And so it does make the period of time so much shorter than it, we'd expect it because David was around 1000 AD, BC, BC, excuse me, 1000 BC. Five generations, we don't know exactly how many years is encompassed with five generations, but to make it only 200 years seems less likely than 400. Anyway, it's, you know, these, these calculations are for people who are more interested in exact dates than I am. Uh, all I can say is that the two theories are, one is that the Exodus took place in the 1200s BC, and one is that it took place in the 1400s BC. I think the evidence in, in the Bible itself favors the earlier time of the Exodus, and therefore a shorter captivity, because you have to factor in Abraham lived around 2000 BC, then there's the life of Abraham, the life of Isaac, the life of Jacob, the life of Joseph, then the captivity, and then they come out 
in 446 BC, that means the whole life of Abraham to the time of the Exodus would be about 400 years, and that would be about, you know, or so. Anyway, I'm not real good with numbers and calculations and things like that. I'm just giving you some of the evidence that people have pointed to for various days. Um, now, Mount Sinai is central to the book of Exodus. The Israelites leave Egypt in chapter 12 and 13, and they travel and arrive at Sinai in chapter 19. And they remain there for the rest of the book of Exodus and the whole book of Leviticus. Actually, they encamp at Sinai for a year. They get there, and, and according to Jewish tradition, the law was given to them on the first uh, well, 50 days after the Exodus, 50 days after Passover. And that's when Pentecost is now celebrated. The Jews believe that Pentecost is the anniversary of the giving of the law. And they remained at Mount Sinai, camped there for a full year before they began to move on. So that full year includes the last half of Exodus, the whole book of Leviticus, and the first uh, several chapters of Numbers. So a lot of the Pentateuch takes place while they are at Sinai. So it's an important geographical place. Now where is Mount Sinai? Now we have maps here. Uh, this is obviously the Sinai Peninsula. And it's pretty, I don't know if there's a bigger, uh, is there a zoom in of that here? Is this it? Yeah, here we go, there we go. Here's the Sinai Peninsula. Now, Egypt's over here. Egypt's over here. This is Sinai Peninsula, and this is Midian, or what's now Saudi Arabia, okay? Um, the traditional location of Mount Sinai is down here at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. But there's some reason to question whether, whether Mount Sinai was in the Sinai Peninsula. You might say, well, of course it would be. It's the Sinai Peninsula. <laughs> well, it's called the Sinai Peninsula because the traditional place of Mount Sinai <laughs> is in this peninsula. It came to be called Sinai Peninsula in more later times. It's, the name Sinai Peninsula is based on the assumption that this spot or some other spot in here is Mount Sinai. So this peninsula would be the Sinai Peninsula. There's evidence, however, in the Bible and otherwise, that Mount Sinai was over here in Midian, outside of the Sinai Peninsula, in Arabia, at Saudi Arabia. Now, when Israel crossed the Red Sea, the general assumption is they crossed somewhere here, the Gulf of Suez. The Red Sea is down here, and it has two little branches that go up that make the Sinai Peninsula on either side. The Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The general traditional view is, here's Goshen, Israel crossed the Red Sea somewhere here. Now notice there's no sea up here. There's just kind of little lakes and stuff like that, but it's kind of marshy through some of that area and stuff like that. So some people think they crossed sort of a marshy area. That was the crossing of the Red Sea. And then they and then they made this trip, you know, along down here to Mount Sinai, camped here for a year, and then wandered around here for 40 years, and then eventually went up here into Canaan. Now, the crossing of the Red Sea then would be associated with the crossing of somewhere on the Gulf of Suez or something associated with it. Then the newer theory is they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba. This was the crossing of the Red Sea over here. Therefore. When they fled from Pharaoh, they came across this way, and they came to some spot along here, and they came, that's where Pharaoh was catching up with them. And they crossed here, and then here in Midian somewhere is where Mount Sinai really is. So there's two different ideas. Now, um, that means they're wandering in the wilderness would be over here. Maybe the reason they haven't found much artifacts of Israel for those four years here is because they were wandering over here. Now, Saudi Arabia controls this area today, and they do not allow <coughs> Christian archaeologists or Jewish archaeologists to mess around there. We have some, there is some footage on YouTube videos of some uh, footage that was taken over here by some Christians who snuck in. They climbed over a fence and did take some footage, and it's on YouTube. And uh, I think they got caught and put in jail or whatever, but they nonetheless, <laughs> maybe briefly, I'm not sure, but, but I mean, they didn't die in jail. But they, the, the probability seems to be that they, they may have crossed the, the Gulf of Aqaba instead of the Gulf of Suez. So almost all the maps in your Bibles and stuff are like this one. They have 
this is what they're calling the Red Sea crossing here somewhere, the Sea of Reeds. In the, in the Hebrew, it actually says Sea of Reeds. Uh, but no one knows where the Sea of Reeds is. The assumption is maybe some marshy, reedy area up here near the top of the Gulf of Suez. But they've got them coming down here to Mount Sinai. Why, why is this mount? Why is this traditionally Mount Sinai? When Constantine the emperor became a Christian, his mother, who I guess became a Christian too, started having visions and revelations about locations of things in the Bible. And a lot of the sacred sites in the Holy Land today were identified by Constantine's mother, by revelation. And she's, as I understand, the one who identified Mount Sinai as being down here. But there's no archaeological evidence that Mount Sinai is down there. There are, there's like three mountains down here that have alternately been re thought to be Mount Sinai. Um, their names in their original languages are Mount Serbal is one of them. Uh, Mount Catherine is another. It's got a, uh, I think it's an Orthodox monastery there. Um, it's a St. Catherine, Mount Catherine. And then the one that's most commonly thought to be Mount Sinai is called Jabal Musa. Musa is a form of the name Moses, so the, the mountain of Moses. Jabal, uh, Jabal Musa is its name in the Sinai Peninsula. So those are the, tr the traditional sites of Sinai. They're all in kind of the same region. But there's no proof that that's where they are. Uh, that's just kind of the way that Constantine's mom identified locations, and then this, because of that, this came to be called the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah, TJ. In the traditional view, um, is there anything that says them crossing another large body of water as they go up through the desert of Moab to then cross another body of water? No, no, but see, on the traditional view, one could say they, once they cross whatever body of water they crossed here, they never crossed another one until they came to the Jordan River because they could go, they could travel over land over here. It, they were in Moab when Moses died, and then they crossed over the Jordan yeah. into the land. So there wouldn't necessarily be another body of water. Okay. But if they traveled from here down here, this would be the body of water they they crossed. And then from there, okay. Right. Now, over on the on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, there is a site that is a new. Uh, theory about where Mount Sinai is. It's called Jabal al Laws, L A W Z, which is not related to the English word laws, but make a great, uh, I mean, since the law was given out, Sinai could be a great name for it. But Jabal al Laws, uh, actually, this is the place I mentioned that they have found artifacts or, and remains of what looks like Israelite civilization at the foot of the mountain, but it's fenced off. It's illegal to go there. Uh, Christians and Jews are not allowed to go and, and research it. But as I said, you'll find YouTube videos about it if you look up uh, Jabal al Laws. Um, and there are photographs of some of the things they found there, including a mountain that seems to be burned on the top. And there's a number of other things about it that are striking. And, and they say that, and I, I can't prove this because I haven't been there, but they say that there's a, a bit of shore here, this is all very mountainous on the western shore of the Gulf of Aqaba, but there's a, a sandy beach along a long strip here where a lot of people could gather. And there's a natural land bridge. It's below the surface of the water, but not very far below the surface of the water, that goes across at a certain point here. I'm not sure exactly what point it is, but there's a point here where if there were strong enough winds or, or God part of the waters, there's like a, I don't know if it's coral or some kind of rock, bridge that's below the surface water that they could walk across on. And some have said, and I, I have to keep saying some have said, because I hear all kinds of things, I don't know, I haven't been able to confirm any of them myself, but, but there are photographs. Uh, at the bottom of the water, there's some, some uh, old coral-covered configurations that look like they might be chariot wheels. Um, so these kinds of things, I mean, we don't, we, don't, we don't arrive at our biblical interpretation based on what people claim maybe a chariot wheel, or there maybe a, this could be where they crossed. But one thing that the Bible does say, Paul said in Galatians 4, 25, that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Oh. That seems significant. Uh, it's Galatians 4. Yeah. Yeah. Galatians 4, 25. 
Paul said, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, Mount Sinai, Saudi Arabia, Arabia in Paul's day and, and Saudi Arabia today is over here on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And that's where the Midianites were. That's where Moses married his wife. When he fled from Egypt, he went to Midian. That's over here. And he was tending his father's father-in-law's sheep when he encountered the burning bush, which was at Mount Sinai. Now it's very unlikely. It's it's very unlikely that Moses would be married over here, tending the sheep of man and have him way over here somewhere, and, find, and came over here, and you know he brought the sheep all the way around here and <laughs> Mount Sinai here. It doesn't seem very likely. So we know that this is where Midian was. That's where Moses lived with his father, law tended sheep. That's where Mount Sinai apparently was. And Paul says Mount Sinai is Arabia, in Arabia. So. The traditional location of Sinai is apparently wrong. And the crossing must have occurred across the Gulf of Aqaba at some point. And there are, as I said, some finds there, which are hard to get to. You have to get over a protective fence to get to them, to see them. But uh, that you can uh, certainly interpret in terms of being an Israelite settlement there. There's a lot more to this than I bring it up, and that's why uh, it's nice to live in a time where I can just say, instead of me giving it, just go to YouTube and, and look this stuff up, <laughs> and you'll find uh, the information. Now, I mentioned a, a video called Patterns of Evidence about the Exodus. That doesn't have this information. That has other valuable information about the Exodus. This information is going to be found if you look up, um, probably, you, you might want to look up in YouTube, The Real Mount Sinai, or something like that. And there'll be a variety of videos that talk about this stuff, interestingly. All right? So, that tells us something about the geography. Yes? Godzilla 1 that you're seeing is the crossing, the real one? Well, uh, is this podium in the way? Can you see this map, the lower parts of the map from where you're sitting, or is the, is the yeah, podium in the way? Yeah, I'm blind. <laughs> okay. Well, you, some Bibles, many Bibles have maps in the back. If you have your Bible, if it has a map in the back, it might be helpful. Although it'll probably show the traditional route rather than and the traditional Sinai instead of what I'm talking about. Because this information has not yet been, has not really caught on in the, in the mainstream community yet. But, so if you have maps in the back of your Bible, some do and some don't. Maybe at the very back if they're there at all. I don't think it names the Gulf of Aqaba, though. It doesn't give the name Gulf of Aqaba? Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you think you're If you want to look later on, you can just go to the map. Now. Sure. Yes, So, probably. when Paul was mentioning Mount Sinai was in um, the Saudi Arabian desert, uh -huh. do you think that's actually where he went when, like, God was. Because he had that one period where, where between when he was converted and when he did ministry. He was in Arabia? Yeah. It's possible. It's possible that Paul went to. Mount Sinai. He was in Arabia. We don't know what he was doing there for three years or whatever. I feel like even says it's like the location. Yeah, so it'd be really interesting if 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 we if we learned that Paul spent those years after his conversion at Mount Sinai, yeah. especially when he's learning about what the law was and was not for and all that. Anyway, that's uh, it's a theory. Uh, what I can say is there is not total agreement, obviously, about where Mount Sinai was or the route the Israelites took. But these newer thoughts seem to have more in their favor biblically and actually archaeologically, <laughs> to, to my mind. I mean, you have to do your own research. But the point is, there is, a, while people have said, skeptics have said for a long time, there's no archaeological evidence of the Exodus or whatever, that's not necessarily true. I mean, there are new things being discovered and reported now uh, as we sit here. These things are, you know, being explored. And so we'll maybe five years, ten years from now, we might know a lot more than we do now. But those, uh, some of the videos would be very interesting. Now, before we get into the, actually, this is an introduction. We're going to take a break and we're going to get into the book itself. But <laughs> I'm just kind of going through introductory stuff. We have to realize how important this Moses is. Uh, I mentioned yesterday how important Abraham is. He's the most respected man in history because Christians, Jews, and Muslims all venerate him. And there's no other human being. 
there's no Chinese or Indian man or anything like that who has more people who venerate him, uh, who is an actual historical character, than Abraham has. Well, Moses doesn't have as many people who venerate him, although Christians and Jews do, and, and Muslims do too. Muslims actually respect Moses as well. Uh, but whether he's highly respected or not, we have to say he's one of the most important people and most impressive people who ever lived. He was a man who took three million people who had been slaves for generations. They were not self-governing people. They were not used to being self-governing. They were people who took orders every moment of every day from taskmasters. They were subservient people. And he formed them into a nation, one of the greatest, most important nations in the world. Israel has been, uh, certainly in the Old Testament times in the Middle East, one of the most uh, <coughs> important nations. And in modern times, it's one of the most important nations in the world. I mean, the, the Jewish people, uh, who were initially the, the nation of Israel, they, uh, they certainly have been extremely uh, significant, disproportionate to their numbers. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, the, the Jewish people are a very small minority of the world's population and have very disproportionately affected both geopolitics, mm -hmm. culture, entertainment, literature, science. And when you think of Albert Einstein and, and other Jewish you know, scientists who've really changed an awful lot of the way we understand the world. Uh, politics, Karl Marx, for example, or, or philosophy and psychology, like Sigmund Freud. I mean, uh, frankly, almost all, but when you consider the uh, people who are making movies and, and comedians and so forth in Hollywood and New York, I don't know what the percentage is, probably at least 50% of them are Jewish. And, and it's a pretty, it's a major percentage of influence that the Jews have had upon the world, though they're a relatively small number of people compared to the rest of the world. I believe, I'm not sure what the current numbers are, but not many years ago, uh, the total number of Jews was estimated to be about 15 million in the world. 15 million. That's like the population of the greater Los Angeles area <laughs> compared to the rest of the world. You know, they're a very small number of people. And, uh, and yet they've, been significant, and yet they started as a bunch of slaves, illiterate slaves, uh, unskilled laborers, and so forth. And yet, that when they, when Moses took them out of Egypt, they had to fight wars, they had to be, you know, formed into armies, they had to be kept alive, wandering in a desert without any crops, uh, you know, without growing anything. I mean, Moses, of course, didn't do this himself; God did it. But Moses is the human leader who, under God was responsible for all of this. And he finally made them one of the most significant nations in Earth's history. Uh, and basically the laws that Moses gave, and it's God, not Moses, but Moses was the instrument. The laws that came through Moses became the foundation of Western civilization. And uh, most of the modern uh, laws in Western civilization have their roots in the laws that Moses gave. And so, this man, living very long time ago, became influential beyond uh, what anyone could have ever expected of an individual from a Jewish man in Egypt, you know, who was picked by God to bring these people out and make them into a great nation, which was fulfilling, of course, a promise that God had made earlier to Abraham. <coughs> Moses didn't always appreciate his role, by the way. He didn't always, he kind of wished that God would choose someone else. And he complained at times because the Israelites were very ungovernable and very rebellious and tended to slip back into bad ways a lot. And Moses had to confront them. And they, uh, you know, they were obstinate. And Moses didn't find it a, a pleasant job, but, but he was chosen and, and, and God gave him the power and supernaturally and so forth to do this. So he accomplished more than virtually any other man in history has accomplished as far as forming a nation and impacting history with that nation. Um, I want to just, before we take a break, talk about a few of the things in Exodus that have, uh, that are significant types of New Testament realities. One of those things is the Exodus itself. The rescue of the, of the Israelites from Egypt, which is the founding of the, of the nation of Israel, is spoken of repeatedly throughout the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And even the prophets talk about there being a second exodus. But it's, the exodus is a spiritual one. 
when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appeared to him, in Luke chapter 9, in verse 31, it says that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration about the exodus that, that Jesus was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. That's the word that's used in the Greek. It says Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about the exodus that he was going to accomplish. Jesus was going to accomplish an exodus. Spiritually, of course. Basically, his death and resurrection were to bring about a deliverance of his people. Not from Egypt, not from earthly powers, but from sin. When Jesus was not yet born, an angel appeared to Joseph to tell him about Mary's pregnancy, and he said, you're going to call his name Jesus because he'll deliver his people from their sins. Mm -hmm. Now, deliverance from sin is... That's the language of setting people free from slavery, but it's a slavery to sin, not to Egypt. And the, the exodus from Egypt becomes in the New Testament a picture of our exodus, our salvation from the bondage of sin. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I mentioned this earlier in one of our lectures, he talks about the exodus. In the opening six verses of, of 1 Corinthians 10, he says that all of our fathers, meaning the Jews, uh, came out of Egypt and they passed through the sea. It says they were baptized into Moses in the sea and in the cloud. They ate the bread that came from heaven. They drank the, from the rock. And Paul says this was all a type of us. That is to say, it's a type and a shadow of our experience. We were saved as the Jews were from Egypt. We have been baptized in water. We've been baptized in the spirit, in the cloud. We eat the spiritual bread of Christ. He's the, the, the manna from heaven. And, you know, we drink the Holy Spirit, which is the living water. Basically, Paul's saying these things that happened to Israel as they came out of Egypt are pictures of what has happened to us spiritually. There has been another exodus Christ has accomplished. So Moses, in a sense, is a type of Christ. Moses delivering his people from bondage is a picture of Christ delivering his people from bondage. The exodus itself, the deliverance from bondage, is a picture of the salvation <clears throat> of the Christian soul. And um, so we, there's many, pro, many prophets that referred to the Messiah's kingdom as, uh, in, in terms of the Exodus. The Exodus historically becomes a paradigm that the prophets would use to speak of a future salvation the Messiah would bring. And Christ, of course, did bring it. Also, in a, a very significant thing in the book of Exodus is the Passover. It was because of the Passover that Pharaoh let the people go. There were ten plagues that God brought on, on the Egyptians, and after the first nine, Pharaoh still was not persuaded. The tenth plague was that God was going to pass through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn son in every household, unless the family took precautions. There was no one who had to lose a son. The family could take precautions. God told them, you kill a lamb, you take the blood, you smear its blood on the lentils and the doorposts of the house, and if you do that, you stay inside the house all night when the when I pass through Egypt, rather than killing your first one, I'll pass over your house and not do that. So it's called the Passover, because God passed over and did not slay the firstborn in the houses that had the blood on them. Now Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, has been slain for us. He's clearly equating Jesus with the Passover lamb. And, of course, this is what brought about the Exodus. But the Exodus is the salvation that came through Christ. The Passover itself is a picture of Christ himself, the one who shed his blood. So we see in the New Testament, Christ is the new Passover lamb. So that at the Last Supper, he says to his disciples, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. This cup is my blood, which is poured out. Now, the Passover, at the Last Supper, Jesus was celebrating the Passover. That was at the Passover. The disciples ate Passover together with Jesus every year that they were together. It's an annual celebration, a celebration of the Exodus is what Passover is. And on the last Passover Jesus had with his disciples, in Luke it says he, he told them, with great desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he went through the regular ritual of the Passover meal, which Jews still do today, but at the point where they, they would normally say, this bread is the bread of affliction suffered by our fathers in Egypt. He said, this bread is my body. This cup is my blood. And then he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. 
Now, the Passover was a remembrance of the Exodus. He says, from now on, when you take Passover, you do it to remember, not the Exodus, but to remember me, what I've done for you, my body, my blood that's been shed for you, the salvation I brought you. So Christ sees the Passover and, and the attendant Exodus as a, a, a picture of himself and what he's accomplished and what he's giving us. There's another uh, important thing I need to make brief mention of right now, and that is that a great number of chapters in the latter part of Exodus are devoted to describing the tabernacle. This was a portable building. The word tabernacle suggests a tent, and it was a tent, but it had solid walls made of wood boards that were attached together. It had, it had wooden, rigid walls, but then they had uh, tents thrown over it. The, uh, it. the roof of it was a tent. They had four uh, tarps, we could say, curtains or tarps. Uh, some of them were made of leather, some were made of cloth, but the point is it it was a tent uh, to all appearances on the outside, but inside it had a rigid structure made of boards that were overlaid with gold and so forth. It was a very fancy building, but it was, it was a prefab building that they could tear it down and set it up. It was a portable building, and uh, it was carried around on carts. Its, its boards and its curtains were carried around on carts because Israel had to move it around for 40 years in the wilderness while they moved around. It had to go with them. So whenever they would travel, it was because the pillar of cloud that represents God's presence among them, the so-called Shekinah, glory, it would begin to move and they'd have to follow it. So they'd be, they'd be camped somewhere, the cloud began to move, someone who's wa watching blows the trumpet says, hey, the cloud's moving. Uh, people then have to pack everything up and, and fold up the tents and fold up the, the tabernacle and put it on the carts and start moving along and follow the cloud until it stopped. When it stopped moving, they set it all up again. And they camp there maybe overnight, maybe a week, maybe a year. They didn't know how long it's going to be before the cloud moves again. But they had to do this. They, they'd tear it down and set it up in every new encampment. There were 42 encampments in 40 years. So uh, this was like a portable temple building. Later on, when they settled in the land, God allowed Solomon to build a permanent building out of stone, which replaced the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a portable worship structure. It was later replaced by the temple made of stone. But in Moses' day, they worshipped in this tabernacle, and God gave elaborate instructions about how the tabernacle was to be made. Mm -hmm. We might say tedious instructions. One of the hardest things about reading the book of Exodus is the disappointment once you get past the halfway point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a rather, rather exciting story in the first 20 chapters. The last 20 chapters, not so much. Because they reach Mount Sinai in the first half, and they camp there for several books, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, and part of Numbers. And while they're camped there, most of what Exodus 20 is about, it does have three chapters of laws, but then the rest of that last 20 chapters is instructions about the tabernacle. So, I don't know, five, six chapters or more, saying, okay, you make the tabernacle this way, it has to be this size, this shape. The furniture has to be this way. The dimensions have to be this way. It has to be done just right. So, And God kept saying, make sure you do it according to the pattern that I showed you on the mount. In other words, God had revealed supernaturally a pattern of the tabernacle while Moses was on Mount Sinai. And he said, make sure you make it here on earth the way I did reveal it to you in the, in the mountain vision you had. Now, what's, what makes it tedious is you not only go through a bunch of chapters describing how you're supposed to do it, a few chapters later, they begin to build it. And it goes through every one of the same details again. They built this way, this size, this shape. And it goes, it's like, you know, do I need to hear this again? I mean, frankly, this is, this itself is one of the proofs that Moses wrote the book of Exodus and that it wasn't a thousand years later. A thousand years later, the Jews didn't have the tabernacle. They had had for many years at that time, Solomon's temple. The tabernacle would be a non-issue to Jews a thousand years later. They'd have no interest in all this detail and this tedium about the tabernacle. Who would? Well, the people who actually had to build it. You know, the people who had to build it had to have this information. So it's another proof that the book was not written a thousand years later. It was written at the time of Moses. Uh, but the point I want to make is when you come to the book of Hebrews, you're told that the reason God kept telling Moses to make sure he builds everything according to the pattern is because 
the pattern showed him in, in the heavens is a pattern of heavenly or spiritual truths. And that the tabernacle was supposed to be uh, an earthly picture of spiritual truths. And so the writer of Hebrews names, he kind of wants to get into it, but he kind of doesn't. He, he says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2, he says, that Moses was a minister of this, or, or Jesus, excuse me, is a minister of the sanctuary, meaning the tabernacle, and the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, not man. Now, man erected the tabernacle on earth, but there's another true one in heaven that Jesus ministers in. That's what he's saying in that statement. Then in verse uh, 5, he says um, that the priests of, of the earthly tabernacle serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So the writer said, God was t told Moses, make sure you make it according to the pattern, because according to the writer here, because it's a pattern of heavenly things, of spiritual things. It's a lesson, a visual aid. And in chapter 9, the first five verses of Hebrews, he says, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary, for the tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Behind the second veil, a part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. You might know it as the holy of holies. Uh, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, all the sides with, uh, overlaid with gold, uh, in which were the golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded, the tablets and the covenant. He kind of lists all these things that are part of the tabernacle and its furniture. He says, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Then he says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail, which is one of the most frustrating lines in the Bible. Because he's just said, there's all this stuff, the way the building's built, the way it's laid out, the furniture being the way it is, it's all a pattern of heavenly things. And I'd love to tell you more, but we don't have time right now. So he, he says, all this is important, but uh, you're going to have to get it somewhere else, not here. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating because uh, it suggests that there are meanings to the tabernacle that are not spelled out in the New Testament, but are in, that, that exist and are implied. And so when we talk about the tabernacle, as we come back from our break, after we talk when you get to that point, I want to point out some of the things we can say about the tabernacle being a, a picture of heavenly things. Uh, some details, not so much. We don't know. I actually have five, uh, excuse me, ten lectures on the tabernacle at my website and uh, go into all the furniture and the details and suggest from New Testament hints what they probably refer to. There's a, a measure of speculation required, but I mean, there are New Testament allusions to these things. So, so anyway, if you really want to get into the tabernacle big time, there is a series, as I said, of, of 10 lectures there um, at the website. So let's take a break, and we'll get into the book of Exodus itself then. All right. Okay. Yeah.